finish up today in Genesis chapter 2. If you will look with me there, Genesis 2, we're going to read 15 through 17. The Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden. Verse 17 is where we'll finish this passage up. Except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you are sure to die. God said you are free to eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Let's pray one last time. Father, we just ask that you would add now your your anointing and your blessing to the reading and the preaching of your word. I pray that you help us to hear what you have to say today. Lord, may we open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the key to us to, to, to getting there goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, all the way back to the very beginning. God placed Adam and Eve in the midst of a beautiful garden, a, full of lush greenery, full of beautiful flowers, rushing rivers, every kind of fruit they could ever hope to eat. There were no limitations on them. They lived with free of the limitations that we understand here on this earth. They were unencumbered by the cares of life. They didn't worry about anything. They, they enjoyed daily fellowship with God as he came down and walked with them in the cool of the day. But there was one command that God gave them, only one thing for them to remember, and that was this. In the midst of the garden, in the right in the very center of this huge garden, there were two trees, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were welcome to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Have you thought about that? They could eat of the tree of life freely as much as they wanted to. There was no prohibition against that, but God the Father told them they should not eat of the fruit of the other tree because if they did, they would die. Now, I want you to understand, everything in this garden was exactly like God wanted it to be for them. He prepared this garden not for himself. He prepared the garden for them. He had taken care of everything. But for whatever reason, Adam and Eve fell for the temptation of of, of eating that fruit. And you know this story. They, They disobeyed God, and because they disobeyed God, they were judged, the earth and mankind were cursed, And we all became natural-born sinners because of our spiritual parents, Adam and Eve. I want us to look at the the choice that they made. They believed that if they ate the fruit, they would know what, what what is good and what is evil. They didn't even know what evil meant. They'd never experienced evil. But they wanted the chance to be like God. They bought into the lie that they would be like God. And so they ate the fruit, not really knowing what it means to die, not really knowing what it means to experience evil. Why did they do that? Because for the first time in their lives, they decided that there was something good for them outside of the will of God. They decided that something good for them was on the other side of God's will and that God's will was preventing them from getting that. So they looked at the fruit, and it looked good. They heard Satan's sales pitch, and it sounded good. They imagined being like God, and that felt good. And so they made the choice to step for the first time outside of God's will and God's command. And then what they found ruined everything. It ruined everything. When when they were living in obedience to God, everything was good and there was no evil. When they sinned, they realized that outside the will of God, even what they thought was good turns out to be evil. And because of their sin and the curse that it brings, then we can't be trusted anymore as humans. We cannot be trusted to determine good from evil. Our discernment is messed up. Our human discernment is messed up. It's broken. That's why Paul who who said in the last days, men will call good evil and evil good. Why is that? Because we inherited that from our parents, our spiritual parents, Adam and Eve. They couldn't figure it out. We can't figure it out either. It's the natural consequence of leaving God out of the equation, 
When God is not in the equation, then you can't know what's good and what's not good. Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, quoted one of the Old Testament prophets, and he said this, there's no one righteous, not even one. Nobody's good. And if we're not good by nature, then there's no way for us to determine what is good and evil. So, John, that's all very interesting. Well, maybe not very interesting. That's kind of interesting. But what does that have to do with us getting there in our lives? It has everything to do with it. Because it shows us why we can't be trusted to determine where there is for us. You say, John, I, I'm, I'm grown. I think I know how to figure out what's good for me, what's in my best interest, and what's not. Well, I want to show you James 1 and 17. I want to show you what it says. Whatever is good and perfect comes down from us, to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Whatever is good and perfect comes from where? Excuse me, comes from who? Comes from God. Everything that is good for us comes from God. That means that anything that's not in His will for us is not good. No matter how good it looks, even if you think it will make you more like God, just like Adam and Eve did, if it's outside of the will of God for you, if it goes against the written word of God, if it violates what your spirit is telling you, it's not good for you. That's why it's so important to pray about God. Want, what God wants for each of us in all of the areas of our lives. Getting there is not just about making up a bunch of goals and plans and then asking God to bless them. It's not us sitting down figuring out what we think is going to be good for us and then lifting them up to Him and asking Him to make those things happen for us. It's about us humbling ourselves to find out what He has to say about it in the first place. See, Adam and Eve were given a choice. They could eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or they could eat from the tree of life. The tree of life is everything God has for us. His will, His plan, His provision, His blessing, His anointing, every, He has everything thought out for us. The other tree is all man-made. That's all us. That's all what we think and what we want. Are we going to eat from the tree of life? Or are we going to eat from the other tree? Are we going to do it God's way? Or are we going to do it our own way? See, both of them have a there. Both trees will take you there. They'll take you somewhere, but they're not going to arrive. They're not, you're not going to go to the same place. See, you, you can try to get for yourself everything that you want and everything that you think is good, or you can do what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Very, very uh, familiar passage of Scripture, but Jesus said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He'll give you everything you need. If you choose to live in the tree of life and you do what he says is good, God takes care of everything else. All of that stuff gets added unto you. You see that? He gives you everything that you need. Everything that's good comes from him. And the way you get all of that good stuff is not by chasing after it. It's by going after him, prioritizing him and his kingdom and living righteously. And then he provides everything that you need in your life that's good. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, well, let me, wow, that's surprising. That made sense. Good. Okay, so let me point out this distinction. When you choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even the things you think are good turn out bad. But look at this. When you eat from the tree of life, even the things that appear to be evil, even the things that appear to be bad for you, Romans says he makes all of those things work together for your good. What an incredible blessing. What an incredible blessing to be submitted to the will of God for our lives. Be sure, so be sure that your there and his there are the same. So no. Okay, John, how do I live in the tree of life? Well, we've already talked about a couple of ways. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Or really, over the, over the whole course of this, we've got to pray. We've got to read the Word of God. We've got to see what it says. We've got to see what God's saying to us from His Word and to us as an individual. There is no way to be a disciple of Jesus without praying and without reading the Word. 
It's our foundation. It's our direction. And so we've got to, we've got to learn to do that. But there's another way that we can choose to live in the tree of life as well. And this one might surprise you, and, and, and that's the, this is the new piece of this today. There's, a, there's another way for us to live in the tree of life. And as a matter of fact, if we don't learn to do this, if we don't learn to master this choice, then all of the other choices become less effective. And I want to show you this in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. The tongue can bring death or life. A different translation says the power of life and death are in the tongue. Our tongues are powerful. You realize that? Our tongues are powerful. More powerful than we give them credit for, I'm afraid. The power of life and death is in our words. It's in our words. Now, this is not an absolute power. I want you to understand this. This is not the absolute power that God has to speak and to make things happen. God spoke the universe into existence. He spoke everything from nothing with his words. He created life where there had been no life. That's not the power that he's given to us because he can't trust us with that kind of creative power. You understand that? Can somebody say, thank you, Lord, right? Woo. All, none of these people around you have the power to create life where there was no life. But what he has done for us is give us the power of agreement. He's given us the power of agreement with our words. We can speak life or we can speak death depending on whose truth we agree with. Isaiah said this. He said, whose report will you believe? Have you lived long enough to realize that there's usually two sides to everything? There's usually two reports that you can believe. You can believe the good stuff. You can believe the bad stuff. If you believe and speak the report of the enemy or the report of your own choices, or the report of your own opinions, or the report of what you think is good, then you're speaking death. But if you believe and speak the report of the Lord, if you agree with what the Word says, if you agree with what He says about your situation and about you, then you're speaking life. With our mouths, we're choosing to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or we're choosing to eat of the tree of life. Just like Adam and Eve, we can choose which tree we eat from, and there are dire consequences to our choice. In other words, what will determine whether or not we get there in our lives is how we use our tongues. Now, this is not exclusive of everything else, but this all fits together. How we use our tongues are going to help determine whether we ever get there or not. Will we choose to speak death, or will we choose to speak life? So I came to encourage you today, and that, that almost never happens. So I want you to get encouraged today. Speak life. Speak life. When your words agree with what God says, you're speaking life. So I want to show you a few areas that, that you can speak life into that will help you get to the there that God's trying to take you to. Here's the first one. Speak life into your prayers. Speak life into your prayers. Now that sounds weird, but let's look at James 1, verse five, verses 5 through 8. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you. How do you ask God for stuff? Pray. Okay? So if you need wisdom, pray. He won't rebuke you for asking. Look at verse 6. But when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. Look at verse 7. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. King James says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That if you don't ask in faith when you pray, that you should not expect to get anything. Now, he was speaking, James was speaking specifically about the prayer for wisdom, but it applies to all prayers. As a principle, it applies to all prayer. And I want to show you why it applies and, and, and how our words are important. But, but first of all, we need to go to Matthew chapter 12 and look at this. Look at the words of Jesus here. Jesus, always making friends everywhere he goes, you brood of snakes. <laughs> Winning friends and influencing people. 
How could evil men like you speak what's good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. I wish this was not in the Bible. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. This is from this is what Jesus said. Y'all remember Jesus, right? Y'all believe in Jesus. We all believe in Jesus till he says stuff like this. We're like, ah, I don't know about that. Our words are important. Why are they important? Because Jesus said they reveal our hearts. Our words reveal our hearts. We say, oh, we didn't mean to say that. We didn't mean that. Uh, probably, you probably did. You didn't mean to say it out loud, but you probably meant it. There's not much that comes out of our mouth that we don't mean at some level. <laughs> oh, Lord, y'all are scaring me. Hush, they're talking to me. <laughs> our words reveal our hearts. They justify our attitudes and our behaviors. If we have a heart of faith, our words will reflect our faith. If we have doubt, our words will reflect our doubt. So ask yourself this question. How many of my prayers have been canceled because of my words about that situation don't reflect faith in God to change it? See, you can pray all day, every day, and then when you start talking after you say amen, that's going to determine what was actually in your heart. James said, if we ask without faith, we are double-minded and shouldn't expect to receive anything. So how do we know whether we have faith or not? How do we know whether to expect to receive what we ask for or not? It comes out our mouths. It comes out our mouths. We've got to make sure that what we pray is in line with God's will, but we also have to make sure that what we say after we pray is in line with it too. Now, if you don't hear anything else about this, hear this. If what we say... Um, and, and if you like rhyming stuff, then get you some. I didn't mean for this to rhyme. It's just the way it is. But if what we say doesn't match what we pray, we've wasted our time. If what we say does not match what we pray, we've wasted our time. We've got to speak life into those prayers. We've got to speak words that agree with what we pray. Well, John, what does that look like in real life? Well, let's just say you're praying about a job situation. I mean, there's a million things to pray about. But let's just say you're praying about a job situation, asking God to provide a job, and, and, and somebody asks you about it. We've got to train ourselves to eat from the tree of life when we talk about it. See, we, we, we have to say, nope, had not got a job yet, but I'm praying and believing that God's going to provide one for me. I've been out there looking every day, and I know that, that I'm just waiting for him to lead me to the right opportunity. See, that speaks life to the prayer that we just prayed. But, but how, how many times do we say stuff like this? Nope, hadn't found one yet. Man, I've looked everywhere and God's just not coming through for me. I thought I had a good chance the other day and he just didn't make it happen for me. I don't understand why God won't give me these jobs. They say they're good jobs and he just won't make it happen for me. That's the same mistake Adam and Eve made. They thought they knew better than God what was good. When you put your faith in God, make sure your words line up with it. Make sure your words line up with it. Speak life into your prayers. Otherwise, you're using the power of death to kill your prayers. <laughs> Here's a second area of our lives that we need to speak life. You need to speak life into the people around you. Speak life into the people around you. Ephesians 4 and 29. It says this, don't use foul or abusive language. Now, this is not just cussing. There's a lot of ways to abuse somebody, okay? Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So, John, I thought this was about helping me get there. Why am I worried about somebody else? Well, see, there's no need to get there if you go by yourself. We need people to help us get there, but we want people around us while we're on the journey as well. This life is supposed to be lived in community with each other. We are one body in Christ. 
We are, we are one flesh. When, when, they, when, when somebody beside you wins, you win. When they lose, you lose. When they fail, we all fail. I saw something this week that said, it, it doesn't make your candle any brighter just because you blow somebody else's out. If you want to succeed in getting there, take as many people as you can with you. And they, you never know when you might need them to do the same thing for you. Anybody ever needed a word of encouragement? Anybody ever needed somebody to pat them on the back and tell them they're okay? I have on a regular basis. I suspect you do as well. Where are the encouragers in the body of Christ? Where are the exhorters? Where are the people that when you talk to them, you walk away feeling like you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof? I've had a few people like that in my life. I have a few people like that in my life. I, and I can't get enough of those people. Where are those people in the body? We, we promote the speakers and the singers and the teachers and, and the, even the helpers, but we've got to learn to promote the encouragers and the exhorters. We need to encourage one another in the body of Christ. Life's hard. Change is hard. Getting there is hard. Are we speaking life into the people around us? When, when people walk away from us, are they encouraged and uplifted by the things that we've said? Or do they feel heavy and burdened down? You, do you make people feel worse when you talk to them? <laughs> or do you make them feel better? Do, they, do, do people avoid you because you're so negative about everything? Or do people come to you and say, you know what, I'm just having a rough day and I always feel better when I talk to you. We've got to watch what we say. We've got to watch how we say it. We've got to watch when we say it. Why is that? Well, I want to show you in Proverbs chapter 15. This is kind of an interesting deal right here. Proverbs 15 and 4. Gentle words are a... Oh my goodness, look at there. Gentle words are a tree of life. Gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes a spirit. One speaks life. One speaks death. We've got to choose our words carefully because we're either speaking life into somebody or speaking death into somebody. Tell the people around you what God says about them. Tell them that they're loved and precious to Him. Tell them that He hasn't forgotten them. Tell them He's got plans for them and wants to see them prosper. Tell them even when they mess up that He still loves them. Don't speak condemnation. That's death. Speak life to the people around you. You cannot nag somebody. You will never nag somebody in the body of Christ. You don't beat them up until they surrender to Jesus. Speak life into those people. You say, well, John, what if somebody's really totally messing things up and they need to hear the truth? Does it mean I never tell somebody something unless it's all rose petals and daisies? No, we can't be that guy either. We're, this, is not, this is not the power of positive thinking stuff. This is not where you just ignore the reality. It's not somebody with snot dripping out their nose and they're coughing their head off and they go, I'm not sick. <laughs> yes, you are. It's not denying reality. It's just choosing to, to, to speak life into the situation. So if somebody needs to hear the truth, speak the truth. God's truth. God's truth is life. How do you know? Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the what? The truth and the life. Mathematics will show you that that equals life and truth are equal to each other. But even if we have to speak God's truth, we do it how? With love. You even speak God's truth with love so that they feel you want them to succeed rather than you want to point out their failures. You speak life into the people around you. Say, so, well, John, that's, that's cool with you know, kind of people I know. What about the people I don't know very well? That's just weird to just kind of quote Scripture to them. Tell them they're going to make it. There's lots of forms of encouragement. Just pat them on the back. Tell them they're going to make it. You, you ever looked at a cashier across the counter? They look like they are about to die. You ever, you ever seen somebody? They just, you're not sure if they're going to make it? I've, I've looked at these, at these girls or these guys and say, what time did you come on today? About an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, never mind. You ain't going to make it. No. I, yeah. 
speak life to these to these girls, to these guys. Say, you know what, you're gonna make it. Uh, man, I know that's a, that's a that's a tough job sometimes. It's all cranky people, but you know what, you're gonna make it. You're doing good. Thank you for taking care of me. And walk away. I didn't use scripture. I didn't preach to them. But if they wanted to be encouraged, they were. Now some people just don't want to be encouraged. Y'all met those people too. Yeah. Well, compliment somebody on something in like a non creepy way. All right. <laughs> Encourage people. Speak life into people around you, whether you know them or not. Here's the last area. Speak life into yourself. Speak life into yourself. So, John, that feels very very selfish. <laughs> no, no, it's not selfish because if there's no life in you, you will never get there. You will never get there. Look at, at 1 Samuel 30 in verse 6. David was now in great danger. Did, did, was, David was a man after God's own heart. He uh, almost always chose to do the right thing. And in this situation, he was, doing, he was doing God's work, God's will, God's way. He was doing the right thing. But David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But look at this last part. But David found his strength in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself. In the Lord. I chose the wrong translation there. David encouraged himself in the Lord. When things are not going well, when he was on God's side and doing God's work, but times had gotten hard, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He spoke life into himself because sometimes there's nobody else around to do it. Have you noticed that? Sometimes you just got to look at the person in the mirror and encourage that person in the Lord because there's nobody else around. You will have a dark night of the soul. You will have a crisis of faith. You will have a spot that you get into where you feel like you are all alone, but you are never alone unless God's a liar. He said you would, he would never leave you. He would never forsake you. So even when the words of the people around you are not doing for you what you wish they would, sometimes you have to look at yourself in the mirror and speak life to that guy in the mirror. Because sometimes you're the only one who knows what you need to hear. So learn to speak life into yourself. Paul said in Ephesians that we need, to, we need to use psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's all based on Scripture. That's all word-based stuff. We need to use those things to speak to ourselves, to encourage ourselves, because we can't depend on the Hendersons to do it for us. It might be Thursday morning. It's going to be days before we see the Hendersons again. We better figure out how to find ourselves, our, our way into the, into the presence of God. We've got to learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Speak life to yourself. Getting there is hard, and we're never going to make it if we don't encourage ourselves in the Lord. So, well, John, what does that look like in, in real life? Well, in addition to praying about the things in your life that you want to change, you can declare the Word of God over your own life. Th this book is full of promises. Not everything that's in this book is a promise to you. Some things are time and place specific, but there are a lot of very universal promises in here that you can use for yourself to speak life over yourself. You say, well, that's kind of weird. I'd rather be weird than dead, right? I'd rather, I'd rather be weird and speak life into myself than to, than to keep being normal until I die, dry up, wither up, and blow away. So if you get concerned about something or if you need to make a decision about something and you're afraid or if you just live in constant fear of this thing or that thing happening, then, then you can say out loud, God has not given me the spirit of fear. He's given me power and love and a sound mind. You encourage yourself in the Lord. If you, if you need to point, then get in the mirror and point at yourself. You know, if you're concerned about some financial issue or, or something going on in your life, you can say, I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord, and He will supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. See, when you're concerned about some sin in your life, and, and then you can declare God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. If you're worried that you, you might not be enough, you might not be able to handle what's in front of you, then you can say it's not by my, my might, it's not by my power, but it's by His Spirit, says the Lord. 
Declaring the Word of God over yourself speaks life. It builds you up. It encourages you to go on. And it gives you the strength to make it to the there that God has for you. Listen, I've done this my whole life, and I I just want to see if I'm just crazy or if you're crazy with me, one or the other, but how many times do you think you've talked yourself out of trying something that God wanted you to do simply because you didn't believe in yourself? You didn't believe you were worthy. You didn't believe you had what it took. You didn't believe you were trained enough or qualified enough. You didn't believe you had the education. You didn't believe you had the charisma. You didn't believe you had the anointing or the gifting or the what did you can fill in the blank with all of the excuses that we use to talk ourselves out of doing what God said to do. Look at Moses and the excuses he brought. Look at Gideon, the excuses that he brought. Just about every man or woman of God who accomplished anything great in the Bible had to deal with self-doubt, had to deal with issues where they felt they weren't worthy to do what God was calling them to do. I'm going to tell you something that's going to set you free. All right, y'all ready? Failure is always an option. Failure is an option. It is entirely possible that you're going to attempt something that's beyond your abilities or that stretches you or that's different than anything else you've ever tried. You'll attempt that and you'll fall flat on your face. Fail. Sometimes epic fail. You say, John, that's, that's not freeing at all, dude. That is not freeing. That is terrifying. No, it's liberating once you own that. Once you say failure is absolutely an option. This is not guaranteed. It can't haunt you anymore. See, that stuff lives in the darkness of your mind. Once you bring it to the light by saying it, owning it, it can't haunt you anymore. You don't have to have that internal conversation because every time that comes up, oh, you might fail. Yes, I might. But I don't have time to talk about that right now. And you just keep moving. You've got to, you see how freeing that is? Every, Every athlete of which I am not, Every athlete goes into the contest knowing that there's going to be one winner and one loser. Or if your feelings get hurt, one winner and one not winner. (laughs) Okay? You realize there is a chance that you're going to lose the game. Does that change the effort? Does that change the, the excitement? Does that change the energy? No. But you have got to learn to to accept that failure is an option. I am by nature, you may not have noticed this, a very conservative person. I know that comes as a shock to you. I don't do risks. I don't jump off of stuff. Diving boards, nothing. Bridges, bungee, no. No, sir. I don't do that. I don't put myself out there. Kind of, I kind of keep myself to myself. I overanalyze everything. I, I want to have all the decision, all the information before I make a decision, all that kind of stuff. Here's what I've realized in my life. Failure is an option, no matter what your game plan is. No matter how you live your life, failure is a part of life, and it's not fatal. Failing will not kill you. Messing something up will not kill you. You will not die. If you lose the game, you will not die. So here's here's what I've come to in my life. I'm tired of playing not to lose. You ever watch the team and you're like, "What what what is wrong with them? They're playing not to lose. They're so afraid of losing that they're not playing to win. And I've been doing that my whole life. Some of you probably have too. I am getting to a place. Now don't expect me to come go jump off a bridge tomorrow. But I'm getting to a place where I'm realizing if failure is an option, no matter what you do, I'm tired of playing not to win. I'm ready to play to win. I'm ready to to do something different. I'm ready to put myself out there a little bit further. If if it's a chance that I'm going to lose anyway, why not go big? Right? Why not take a shot for the end zone? Why not throw it farther than you think you can throw it? Why not put yourself out a little further than you're comfortable? It, it, it is true that it's entirely possible that you might fail, 
But it's also entirely possible that if you will take the limits off of God and put yourself out there a little further than, you, than you're comfortable with, you also might just succeed beyond your wildest imaginations. You might just accomplish more for the kingdom than you ever dreamed you could accomplish. So speak life to yourself. Speak life to yourself. Stop talking yourself out of stuff. Stop telling yourself why you can't or why you shouldn't. Take a chance on God. Take a chance on trusting that what He says is true. Get out of the boat. Run after Goliath in your life. Keep standing when everybody else has bowed their knees to the idol. Stop living your life not to lose. Find out where God's there is for you and then go after it with everything that you have. Speak life to yourself. I'd rather lay on the field after a tough loss, blood on my face, mud on my uniform, knowing I'd given everything I had in that pursuit and lose than to sit on the sidelines with a clean uniform wondering what might have been if I'd given it a little bit more. If you're going to get there, you have got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Say what God says about you and about your situations. Speak words that agree with Him and then fearlessly walk in the direction that He sends you. We've got a choice to make. When we live in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're telling God that our there is better than His there. Our ways are better than His. We know more than Him. We know better than Him. But when we live in the tree of life, we are acknowledging that God has thought of everything and that anything that's good for us is going to be found in Him. So today I'm going to say to you what Moses said to the children of Israel. I set before you life and death. And just like Moses who didn't want him to fail the test, choose life. Choose life. Speak life. Live life. It's the only chance we have. There's no, no indication of reincarnation in the Word. This is the only shot we get. I want to be spent when it's my time to lay down and close my eyes and breathe my last. I don't want to have another ounce of nothing in me. I want to leave it all here, making every effort to do what God called me to do with, every, with, with my dying breath. There's no retirement plan in the Word. There's no coasting. One of the intercessors told me this morning in prayer, he said, I feel like the Lord is saying that it's a time of acceleration. You've been preaching about getting there, and there's a lot of process involved in, get, in going on a trip, going somewhere. There's a lot of process. You've got to pack. You've got to load the car. You've got to fill up the car with gas. You've got to figure out where you're going. You've got to navigate. But once you get in the car and you close the door and you know the destination, it's time to accelerate. This intercessor said, I, I believe that God is saying it's time to accelerate. And I'm receiving that because I'm sensing that as well.